to feedback and then we'll start kind of integrating some of the points and opening up the discussion and then ideally coming up with some kind of core principles, values, action points that we might want to take forward. Well, at least we, we aim to do that and let's hope we can. So should we start with... Um, organisations to do that job of creating cohesion. Of course it did, and it did it really well, um, but it raised in the group the notion of the potential instrumental nature of art. So yes, it can bring communities together, and there was a question about the sustainability of that bringing together. Um, examples in terms of history was the Rock Against Racism um, Initiative Festival, um, but also the relationship between art and politics, so that there is a, a deep relationship between art and politics, um, and that art can both, you know, it, it both emerges out of, art making emerges out of the stuff of society, um, but it also takes something back into society as well. Um, so I guess you can have, you know, look at that both either instrumentally or as change causing, um, transformative. Um, there were some questions from our group, who is bringing, who is doing the bringing together? So there was a kind of tension between, you know, top down um, as opposed to community, grassroots, really driving arts um, agendas. Um, and Jackie gave the example, yeah, Jackie, great, you gave the example of park life. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything about that. Oh, this, we were talking about accountability of the uh, sort of projects that start off as community-based projects. Part of that started out as Mad Ferry, it was just a uh, student um, festival for the end of the academic year, uh, which then became Part Lab, which is an enormous festival, and in the process completely trashed uh, Platfield's Park to the extent that what's well, called the second lake, actually. So the park was unfit for purpose for the juggernauts that we ended up bringing in. And uh, the park is still unusable in an area where there aren't any. It's the terrace. It's called Terrace Square. Uh, people don't have gardens, so the community has in fact been left with broken park. Uh, this is about three years later. It's still not. So it, that also feeds into the next point, which was there's an ethical responsibility on us all, really, in terms of who leads. Um, uh, in um, generating you know, arts in communities. Um, that raised the issue of funding and also issues of race and class as well. Um, and uh, Sasha gave the fabulous example of the Black Lives Matter march. Um, so 1,500 at the start of the march and by the end it had accumulated 3,000 thereabouts with people coming out of their houses to join in. So that kind of gave a sense also of, the, you know, of that relationship you know, the kind of relationship building in terms of the arts and um, and I suppose a sort of gathering energy and solidarity around art, the arts as well. Um, I'm conscious that I'm taking longer than five minutes. That's okay. Brief points in terms of number two, how might the arts tap into the deep resilience? Well, a big question for us was around gatekeeping. Um, who are you? Who are your connections? The relationship between gatekeeping and programming coming back to Black Lives Matter and the race class dimensions, um, but also media coverage as well. Um, you know, what the media cover, um, what's accessible, um, but also I, it, this kind of taps into the last point as well about the hope really of reaching communities. Um, and we talked a little bit about home as well as the venue for this event. Um, what gets programmed at home, what's likely to get programmed at home, uh, what would be great if it were programmed at home, you know, in terms of challenging the sort of dominant narratives. Um, 
We also talked about, um, in terms of resilience, that community arts have got this massive history, you know, since the 60s, um, both uh, as, you know, community, as artists and producers, but there is this incredible archive that community arts hold, um, you know, can, um, you know, which tells of the deep resilience in communities, but also this relationship between, you know, community members as producers of, of, of art um, and the benefits of all that, but such an enormous amount of knowledge and research, uh, amount of knowledge in community arts organisations who've been in, you know, situ for a long period of time. And so tapping into that, I think, is so important in terms of generating um, knowledge and understanding. Um, and somebody said it helps us to understand, you know, how, why we're at this point now, or how we're at this point now as well, by looking at that, you know, incredible archive. Um, barriers. Um, I might need some help at this point, Hilary. <laughs> My scribble, because we went off the. Um, we've got gatekeeping. Um, funding is obviously a big one. Yeah. Um, to talk about um, a sort of sense of lack of empowerment within communities to sort of shape their own direction and to do their own thing. So this idea that um, we've still got a kind of feeling that, oh no, Brexit's happened, but it's like we don't have any control over it. And actually there was some discussion around the need for communities to really sort of try and take control of things and to, um, and to take it in the direction that they want to go in. So less of a kind of reliance on um, outside institutions and the government sorting it out or that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think the appetite as well, there was a sort of, what's the appetite for the art, if art is stymied, if creative, you know, the kind of creative practice is stymied at school and then because of funding difficulty, access to university as well, um, what then, ha what, what, what legacy does that have for us in terms of, you know, involvement and appetite for um, arts? Um, yeah, so that kind of connects to ages too, and how connected we feel to the arts as a sort of transformative potential. Is there anything else that you might like? Yeah. Yeah. Great. So in terms of um, ways forward, um, collective action, um, I think um, I can't remember who it was in our group who said that, you know, we had, I think it was Jackie actually, that we had Julie's, you know, presentation which was quite, you know, oh gosh, you know, this is really, or almost this paralysis around that, heavy duty, you know, this is happening. Um, but then um, Tom's presentation in terms of what's happening in the Netherlands was really inspirational for, and also, you know, we talked a lot about art being co-opted, but actually what, you know, what was great to hear from your project was how you were actually co-opting sort of capitalism at its own game in order to produce something which was really anti, you know, the kind of individualist, capitalist, neoliberal um, stuff. So that was a really you know, positive um, potential. Um, what else did we have here? Um, we also discussed the potential and the scope to sort of harness the dissatisfaction that there is with um, the system you know, some of what the vote for Brexit might be a manifestation of that, but perhaps there's also potential to uh, use that dissatisfaction to sort of create positive change and to create something different, something better. Um, we also um, looked at the importance of breaking down the barriers in the art world or the sort of false dichotomy between um, art and community art um, and looking at ways of um, building solidarity and connections and looking beyond Europe towards global connections.
Um, but also in contrast to that, that art can be and maybe should be in some, some cases controversial um, and not neutral. Um, it can be an absolute catalyst for change for individuals and wider communities and beyond. I think. We recognise that it has to be managed well in order to be um, to bring about positive change. It can go horribly wrong. Um, about creating a safe space so the art can lead on to other things and other conversations and other signposting. And it creates an opportunity for people to tell their story and meet people they wouldn't normally. It can be therapeutic, and then there was a, a conversation about whether it should be, and it, you know, um, is it art first and then process second, and really we want both the uh, good quality products plus a good quality process for individuals. Um, and the the sense of art leaving people feeling those that have been involved in a more powerful position to bring about their own change that they want for themselves. Key part at the centre, products and process, um, and getting a balance of things of that. Um, come from a place of celebration. Uh, we talked about, I'm not sure which number this goes under really, we talked about um, funding to work with refugee communities can be limiting um, because it means you can only work with that community and really what we want is to work with whole communities to, for looking more at cohesion and bringing people together. Uh, number two, we took that oh, one sorry, one. that's number, number three. Oh, that number three. Yeah. I just put it in one place. See, this is why I'm here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Because uh, it gets a bit crazy from here, when I really, I'll be honest. So, number two, I can't remember what that question was. So it's about resilience. Oh yes, so yeah. it's a complex situation, um, and point that I think Julie made earlier about not yeah. We talked about being problem focused versus solution focused, and what is it that we so want to be. Right. Yeah. So seeing Brexit as a problem is the problem in itself. Uh, because it can make something into a problem that potentially I've written down adversity brings about opportunity. Adversity brings about opportunity. <laughs> um, <laughs> shared currency. So we had a bit of a conversation about this notion of problems and what is a problem for one isn't necessarily a problem for another. So if I go wanting to fix the problems in a community, they're my perceived problems and not necessarily problematic. So me seeing Brexit as a problem. Actually, when I'm working with people who voted leave, it's not a problem for them, is it? So, um, so it's understanding my filter and how that could be different and trying to connect. So I, I want to get buy-in for my problem and, and um, create shared currencies so that I'm working towards something with people rather than telling them finger-wagging way what it is that they should be worried about. Um, and we talked, building on, I think Tom used this phrase in his in his presentation about giving and getting, so it's not one over the other, it's about both. Yes, yeah, so often as arts organisations, we can focus on what we're giving more than what we're getting, and that we need to be careful as arts organisations that we, we don't fall into that trap. Um, yeah, I think that, that's quite important. Yeah, so the, the, and that's a, I suppose is about the barriers as well, isn't it? So not becoming blinkered by our own view and perception of the world and our own political opinion as well and whether or not that can be neutral or whether it should be neutral. Um, some, we recognise that some artists might be more interested in their work rather than the impacts for that community or <coughs> those people that they're working with. So it's really about matching the right artists to the right group of people or projects or whatever it is that they're working on. Being led by funding rather than need or want is a barrier because sometimes we go through the hoops of the funding provider rather than doing what it is that we believe we should be doing or want to be doing. It's difficult to quantify the impact of our projects. Um, if anybody's got an answer, like a magic toolkit, how they do this, please share it because I've not found it yet. And between us, tried lots of different ways of doing that thing. And it'd be great to have a more 
if something comes out of things like today, it's about how do we do that across across the board. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, there was a recognition that artists are not always paid for what they do, so that not, sometimes not even a living wage, and there's a lot of expectations that artists will make things happen when actually they're not being paid for what it is that becomes an expectation. And do artists value their own contribution as well? Do people think, well, I'll just do that, or I shouldn't get paid that much for doing that, I'll just make it happen, and that's devaluing their own work as well. Is that for number three? Number four, new ways. Um, oh, there is, yeah, sorry. So people, thank you. People, um, mm, oh, so something around people being more vocal following Brexit, so this whole perceived permission to say mm -hmm. what people think a bit more. Um, so, we, we felt that there was a need for intervention um, but the, to sort of kick us while we're down that a lot of funding has been stripped away so we know there's lots more we want to be doing but actually we've got less perceived resource in terms of financial funding but I think in terms of leading into what we want to do I think actually there's more people wanting to do something so actually it's a, that collective action sort of notion of partnership and collaboration I think yeah, having you less funding. Really people in your project who didn't weren't interested in things before, and all of a sudden yeah. they want to get involved. I think it, for me it's on two levels that. So uh, having been an arts officer with a budget, you know, at one time quite a healthy budget, um, it meant I could be quite spontaneous and laissez-faire about what I wanted to do and meet somebody and say, yeah, let's do that, and we're going to pilot without necessarily connecting back to wider strategy, um, whereas now, and also I could be very independent, so I didn't have to really speak to anybody else, I didn't have to seek permission from anyone, I didn't have to go begging to anybody, I just decided. But actually that probably kept me quite blinkered, whereas now I have no budget, so I have to look. It's like I'm a commissioner with no budget, so probably I have to look to all the other people in the room to say how can we make this happen together, and actually I think that's much richer more rich than, than me just doing my own thing because I fancied it at you know, the time. I'd like to think I didn't do that, but you know, I probably <laughs> um, And then also, I was talking about from a community perspective, so a group of women that I've worked with quite closely um, who accidentally ended up writing a play about their lived experience of domestic abuse. We didn't know that's what they were going to do, but that's what they ended up doing. They, they were a very tight-knit group, and that, um, a colleague asked them probably about 12, 18 months ago, I'd love to do this project with you, you're brilliant, let's go and work with people around cohesion and how can we bring this community together and there's real problems here and what do we do? And they all turned away and said, no, we don't want to go there, we don't want to get involved, I don't want to work through my window. Whereas now, because I've no longer got any funding, I've said, look, if you don't have a cohesion project, we're not doing anything. And they're like, yes, 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 me, 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 I'll do it, I'll do it. So they're going to go around and interview people in their community and they will create something wonderful. Whereas 12 months ago, they wouldn't go near it. So actually, Adverse brings about opportunity. Um, we talked about asset mapping, community asset mapping, and using that as a starting point. So that's I've not been patronising really actually about people's skills, and especially with new communities, people bring incredible skills and experiences that we can. It's easy to forget or to assume that they don't. You know. Partnership working, getting real, um, and interconnecting what it is that we're doing. So not just plunking an art project in because it feels like something nice to do, or I've got a bit of cash sloshing about, but actually what is it that people need in that area or want? And other um, service providers as well. What you know, so if someone's not I now have housing colleagues coming to me saying, um, we've got so many reports of antisocial behaviour in this street, can you go to that street? So I'm being more direct really in where I go. I'm no longer walking around in a bubble of loveliness, just throwing money at artists as I please. <laughs> and I have to go and knock on doors of racist people and ask them to, to come and join my group, you know. So. But actually, it probably makes much more impact in, in the areas where I'm working. Because so we're probably doing a much better job now than I was when I just walked around with a feather bow on before. <laughs> um, and then I've scribbled down loads. So there was a triangle. Do you want to talk about the creative? Capital, business capital. Where did that come from? You were talking about that we needed three things. <coughs> capital, creative capital, business capital, and social capital. Tied in with talking about new business models. We've been talking about lack of funding for things and we've been talking about 
artists starting businesses or buying property and then we diverted and said, well actually like do we really want to be putting our resources into that and would we get distracted? And I think I was just thinking about um, just that I've heard before like there were three things that that artists need, they need the creative capital, the economic capital and the social capital, kind of like a triangle. And so I'm just kind of thinking, can we think a bit more creatively, you know, and work across sectors and network with different people so that actually we're partnering with businesses who want to fund projects and partnering with people who have the connections and networks so that we're not kind of trying to do everything ourselves. Um, so that was, that was all that. And Tom gave the example, and he showed me this when he went to Amsterdam, of an arts organisation who've opened a petrol station. So they run this petrol station. Do you want to just say you can say it more? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so they run a petrol station and volunteers who work in the organisation have a day or so in the week where they serve petrol. Um, <laughs> but this one's the arts organisation. So then we got into a whole debate about is that positive or is that actually taking you away from your core mission, which is to create art? And you know, it was quite a lively debate. We saw both sides of the coin really on that one. Yeah. But you said, which I really like in Amsterdam, oh, we, I always get my petal from this petal <laughs> because I know that it's going to fund art, you know, yeah. so it's quite interesting what people will buy into. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, sorry, very quickly, we talked about um, lobbying, so rather than accepting what's happening, yeah. do we have a voice in lobbying government bringing about? policy change, um, could there be a shift in how taxes are spent, you know, what's our advice in that in that process? New business models and that and then that conversation about well, should it be a business model or is it just new models that don't have to get sucked in necessarily to the business um, focus because we want to maintain our moral compass as well and our guidance for not being tied to external funding so other ways um, so Tom has got loads of great examples we all need to come and visit and talk <laughs> um, about uh, the Kodak um, factory being closed down and people taking ownership of that back and running it themselves. Um, and essentially that communities can make things happen that are important to them, so not stifling that but ena enabling that as best we can. And you gave the example of if you go in and you make bread for people and then leave, they won't know how to make bread. But if you go and you teach people how to make their own bread and and when you go, people will make bread. That's a really that good example. Yeah. There's the whole thing to give people fish or a fishing net sort of metaphor, yeah. isn't it? Great, thank you. Mm. Um, is it John or? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> I was volunteered and I've uh, crystallised uh, nodes, which is a way of saying we don't have quite as much as some of the other groups. But we'll just see where we go. So, on the first question, um, so I've done these as a kind of comment and then a but, so it all came from different people. So it was then, what do we mean by culture? And this led, this was Fred who then saying that, um, perhaps giving an example of how cultural production, the important thing in a way from a project, is sometimes the networks that get created in order to produce the artworks. When you talk about culture, you often think about the end product, but actually the process of that being made is where a huge amount of the value lies. Now, there's a very specific example about a kind of um, a campaigning element, but I guess we would think that could lie in, in sort of more broadly. Um, so that's the kind of, that's the sort of, and then there's a, a but, which came later, but I think it's related, is that, um, so that's the positive thing, but the status quo that has the power will not support things that challenge that status quo, but will we'll tend not to actually have those things having the resources to happen. Um, it was commented that it takes a lot of effort for individual artists to make connections with new art, new audiences, so to make that kind of engagement. So lots of people, whether it's through organisations, but individual artists. Um, and then I suppose the but to there, in a positive way, is they can link up with existing organisations and networks and extend their reach and no artist needs to be isolated. Um, it was commented that art can take, so it's still on this first question, art can take things into people's minds and introduce people to a culture in a very positive way. Um,
but that people need to make sure they do their research yeah. around communities. Uh, like we were saying about a specific example of how you can get it very wrong and can end up causing offence and just people need to sort of take the time and do the, do the research. Um, Remy commented, that I think everyone felt essentially just for this first question there was a yes. Remy said, so arts and culture can bring people together, but he said the model really needs to change. And this led us on to a lot of our other discussion about, um, but he just said saying essentially that the, um, the bigger arts institutions don't, aren't able to connect to communities because they don't know how to do it, even if they think they do. And they're not willing, he said, to take the risks to invest in the people who can do it. Um, and there's a big, there's sort of a disconnect. We'll kind of return to that in a minute, I think. Um, so we're talking about, so yeah, so we're talking about barriers. I think it was a question I wanted to raise by asking about a place like this. And um, it was said that people from the diverse community are not, would not come here. So there's some discussion of whether that, in a way, would it matter? Why should you be bringing energy into getting people in, or did they have a role, the kind of role that they have? But this was the, the concern was that the people with money and power don't understand, don't have the connections with communities, don't understand communities, and are therefore not really able to make those connections. And I mean, there's a whole obviously a big discussion to be unpacked there. Um, one of the things that was also pointed out was that uh, to do, to work with communities, artists need to be part of those communities and that takes time. And these are kind of quite different models. So I, I don't know that there was, sort of, I think that there was lots of points of view about how, and so there's big organisations and also funders. Uh, and we talked about the barriers in terms of funding the, how difficult it is to make an arts council application, and then that's for anyone. Uh, for people for whom language is also a barrier, it's become increasingly difficult. For people who inside knowledge and networks is a barrier, these things um, become very, very difficult. Uh, but we also talked about <coughs> accountability and whether. Um, this is something I feel is that organisations, bigger arts organisations, are talking more the kind of language that we're talking today. I don't know if I'm going to feel that's true, than they maybe did 10 years ago. So I think you can have some of a big arts, mainstream arts organisation, they wouldn't feel they had no idea what we're talking about, or that that's just something for the education or participation department. So I feel in our work, you feel that, but they're not necessarily actually delivering. Some maybe some are to different degrees, but um, how can well, how can that accountability in like with the funders? How can people be how, because they can be very good at telling a story of what they're doing? Because when they sometimes, if you have sort of power, it becomes quite easy to dominate and to say and to explain what you're doing and how brilliant it was. So, but where's the real accountability for all the people who aren't being reached? I know that was, I guess, that was the question. But you were talking about them. You are trying to hold them accountable around the training. You know, yes. So basically, it's kind of one of the very small things, which, when you look at it, is kind of huge. Is that when, for example, when um, artists, mainly refugees, kind of felt a bit isolated, and they have different barriers. It's language. It's not understanding the system. And uh, we have that sort of kind of thing. And then when you, uh, and then the other thing is kind of. Uh, the people in the power looking at, okay, what is the need? And sometimes they don't understand the kind of, there is other needs that maybe you should have to look at, which is kind of giving more support to communities, which we talk about that uh, this is a barrier that they don't have enough support. And then um, this sort of um, artists or communities, which felt a bit isolated, that also kind of raising this sort of awareness that this is, um, these are the gaps and need that to be kind of maybe you have to look at because when you look at the structure and system, there is other criteria that they only look at that kind of sort of thing that you kind of maybe need to kind of uh, just 
raise the voice of, okay, when you look at the diversity, when you talk about, okay, you want unique art, uh, you want to kind of engage more artists, okay, but <coughs> in the truth, when you look at the application, when you look at the different situation of um, the way that you have to work with um, different artists, there is also these needs that you have to kind of adjust them with the way you, uh, you're doing your applications or um, you're thinking about kind of giving the opportunities. So uh, basically the question is very interesting that kind of we want to engage communities. But then when we look at the barriers and in the middle, uh, we talk about you know, just all different uh, kind of little options that okay, so yes, of course, art in this way and different ways can engage communities and we have these sort of barriers and we, we know so many needs that needs to be filled in and unfortunately there is no money or no funding for it. And then the outcome is, okay, now that we've got the barriers, okay, so we came up with some ideas of, uh, we think, for example, with individual communities, how to kind of, you can share the interest, how you can have something common that you can kind of, because it came out all this, I think, each of us can feel that in the discussions that uh, there is something that we have in common and we are interested to kind of look at. Also, oh, there is kind of this need uh, to kind of to work out, which is uh, kind of what we talk about. Mm. So we talked about, um, well, just sort of, there's also this, under, uh, that the expertise is there within people who have those communications, there's a lot of expertise that we tap. In terms of resilience, I thought there was a, there was a comment um, that was made that you, there's a big distinction between community-run shows that tend to be a lot of audience and not a lot of money, and often really well-funded shows that tend to have not so much audience but a lot of money, and that is feels frustrating, and it's also a testament to community resilience because communities are still able to make this stuff happen. So it's the question of how can you no one wants to be without an audience. So uh, I think that we're talking about the ways you can bridge that divide, the people divide, the people, I don't know, whatever the answer is to doing that. Um, and then in terms of ways forward, so we've spoken about a few of those. Um, I think it's what I was just saying, the last thing really, is how can, to bridge those gaps that still seem to be very large between people who really understand communities that are coming from understand how they can be reached but there's a lot of people with uh, power and money who are making those connections for whatever reasons. Do anyone else want to add anything? Um, uh, I'll try to be really brief. I, I think I'm, I'm in some ways familiar with the issues having worked with the community arts, so-called community arts organization for 15 years in Manchester. But I'm also alienated by aspects of the conversation because we all probably are parts of different communities. If you're talking about your geographical community or your ethnic community or your racial community or your religious community, we're at different parts, different times, parts of different communities. Community is a group of people who have a relationship that share certain things in common. If you want your community to grow, you have to invest in your community. Like you have to invest in a relationship. For myself, my core mission is not to create art. I know you were just giving it as an example, so. But if you're, and I value and I appreciate because I've worked with lots of artists and um, my partner's an artist, I can appreciate what she is doing with her sculpture or painting. There is something essential in that engagement of her with her art, which is part of her core being. And without it, that cultural aspect without it, she is not the same person as she is with it. Just as much as mates of mine who are musicians, when they've had to stop playing for five years, there's something in their life, that, in their culture, that's missing. So there's that individual, and, so, and I get it through cooking, maybe, or playing drums, and someone else would get it in a different way. But I think there's a different aspect of art, which is not the individual artistic expression, which is how cultural expressions on a broader level exist within the community which relates back to we were talking about skills and if you're someone who has artistic skills or creative skills which are generally devalued in this society if you wish to use those skills in a transformative way you're actually engaging in politics yeah 
So I see myself more as a political activist part-time than an artist. And if I talk about a community and I want to see the role of art within a community, I have to first say I am part of the community. And as you were just, someone was just saying, you establish a commonality of interest and identity interest within your community. And if art or something that someone has produced can help someone to reflect back in a clearer way their understanding of their own community, their own society or a local issue, then that artist excels or has a meaning for that group of people. If you, if you parachute in either a community center or a piece of art or a project that's got government funding, if it doesn't correspond to the interests of the, the, the local people, they're going to look upon it as, what's the point? And I gave, you know, if I give two examples in Moss Side in Manchester, in Manchester they, commit, they created a community education center called 8411 in the mid-70s. And it became this concrete block of a building that got parachuted into Moss Side and they had a and market, they had a library, but the black community in Moss Side and the, the Irish working class community in Moss Side didn't go to it. And eventually it got stripped down and didn't exist. The most successful event in the, in the community arts, so-called community arts organization that I was a part of was in 1987 and it was a campaign against a woman who had been a Jamaican woman who got home to look after her mom. She overstayed for a couple of weeks. She came back and they wanted to deport her. Her name was Cynthia Gordon. And we organized an event, we, I'll come back to, we organized an event where we were working predominantly black organizations or black issues got together and we organized this event together and this is what we were saying. What came out of that was a solidarity amongst those organizations who continued over the next five years to do shared work, whether it was a celebration of African culture or something on Palestinian culture or Latin American culture or um, talks about racism. But it was through working together with different organizations and identifying what we were just saying, identified a common interest. And into that common interest, when we organized events, there was always food. And there was always music. And there might have been someone doing a poem. And there might have been a film. Whatever was appropriate to the thing. But we had shared common interests that those cultural expressions gave, reflected back to us something that, that helped bring us together. So my individual or my collective work with, with a partner is, is a political one. We want to engage in things that allow people to have individual expression, which is important for our own lives, but to try to be transformative in, and in our local communities. In that respect, we have to be part of our communities. What you're talking about in your example is, whilst you moved in there, it's, it's working because you're working within the needs of your community. And the different forms of expression, be they the garden or the canteen or whatever, arise out of the needs of that community as opposed to someone getting a funding to go in and I'm going to do a project for as opposed to we are doing something with how do we all get together and make it work to our mutual benefit. Sorry for going on too long. Okay. Um, are we moving on to the next group? Sarah? Let's get going to feedback. Um, just in terms of the first question we just took it as, yeah, yes, yeah. let's go to the second question. Because we wanted to talk about the other questions, so we didn't really analyse that to, in fact, we didn't analyse that at all. So, we wanted, so yeah. we were really taking that second question, that we wanted yeah. to have a conversation around what that meant. And we feel that arts do tap into the deep limits of communities by giving people strength and restoring dignity. Um, arts gives a chance to people to connect to their histories and roots and the stories and narratives of communities give people resilience. We spoke about the importance of historical memory and stories of migration that need to be passed on. Um, we said that people have to be resilient in times of conflict. Um, it's part of survival when people have to change their lives. When people become disconnected from their history, this causes problems and there needs to be a need for memories of home. Um, we talked about let stories be heard and these stories can connect with everyone to some extent because we all share some sense of displacement and people understand ideas around loss, abuse, neglect. Um, the idea that not being alone in what you're going through because other people are going through the same thing. Um, when people are telling stories about conflict, 
Um, it gives people strength and dignity to the person telling the story, but also the, pe the people who are hearing the story, so it's a two-way process. We spoke about the different kinds of communities, the community of interest, place, and art bonding people together via a shared language. We spoke about the importance of being aware of what has happened before um, in terms of the first and the second generation immigrants. We spoke about um, the remarkable things that can be created in times of conflict, from orchestras being created through recycled materials to the Kinshasa Orchestra. Um, do you know what that was? Yeah, I think there's something that everybody talked about was within those kind of stories and tellings. It's, it's a, the stories of remarkable resistance within communities, and that's a legacy we all have across communities, from communities. And, and I would say, you know, we kind of like, a, you know, losing touch with those stories. People sitting around waiting for something to happen, or some funding to happen, but actually just the stories of people, like the example of your story of community getting together and actually just doing something and making it happen this relates to all of us and there are some incredible stories across the globe in Britain, in this region, in this city, in all the towns surrounding it. And we need to kind of remember them from the cooperative movement to the trade union, you know what the trade unions used to do in communities through its migrant stories, the story from Guatemala, which is on the year, from Guatemala people's resistance and um, they're there, they're out there and our ancestors did it. Yes, the idea of like using what you've got and that you don't need a silly new pin or new photo and you can create no matter what. Um, what are the barriers we face? Um, we spoke about that even the left have their prejudices. Um, most of us are working in situations that promote diversity, but how confident can we be in dealing with conflict? And the importance of creating safe spaces for alternative voices. We spoke about that in the arts, there's a growing idea of self censorship and people not taking things on that they think will create trouble. We presume that the art world is progressive, but it's full of its own prejudices, especially around class and race. We asked the question are there tolerance thresholds in the art sector and do these thresholds keep shifting? We need to ensure we have a compass allowing the expression of all ideas and we're not here to police. We need to continue to open up arenas so that people can contribute. Um, I spoke a little bit about Brexit and how um, I've been to a lot of panel discussions about Brexit and I've not heard a single argument from someone who actually voted leave. Um, so the idea that we need to sharpen up on the other side of the argument and give a space for the other voice to be heard. Um, what are the ways forward? Documenting culture, uniting, not to lose hope, not to be dysfunctional, bringing people together in terms of like food and celebration, and um, I think Karen spoke about agricultural, um, yeah, agricultural project that's happening in Tottenham, and the idea that people getting people together to do things and to make and create and not just witnessing other people doing things, get them to do things for themselves and that will make everyone feel better. <laughs> <laughs> we were very proud. <laughs> um, I think there's a, huge, there's a very kind of consistent, coherent thread going through all the responses I and mean, it obviously gets picked up in different ways but just practically speaking, if this is being recorded it would be a really good session to have transcribed if anybody can help out with this. If we're going to practice what we preach, maybe we can cooperatively transcribe it, mm. and rather than leaving it to can to do it. Mm. Um, but I think it would be nice to be collectively authored in some ways. And I'm just going to run through some of the threads and then maybe we can open it up to some key action points if we think we can um, produce some action points. But I was struck by Maggie starting with the kind of memory of the, you know, the community arts movement, but also that period in the 80s post-riots where the government and the state really looked to the arts as a way to step into a space that needed to be you know, mediated and, and occupied, if you like. But that the, the, the flip side of that was the increasing instrumentalization of the arts. And I think that is kind of a memory in this room that all of us have literally embodied at different stages. And there's a danger maybe that, and it's a danger, so I'm going to be provocative, 
that we will re-instrumentalize the arts if we're not careful. So I think you know, part of this day is about a number of us trying to think about how can we work um, strategically ourselves, how can we think our own collective strategies. Um, and I'm struck also by the point you made about when you have money, um, strategy is never in the room because opportunity is always in the room. But when you don't have money, strategy is in the room because you have to think very hard about what you're going to do. And I think that's really a lesson learned for all of us. Um, but also, um, um, so the history of the community arts movement is key, and that notion of history and memory and the archive, and where is that archive? Mm -hmm. um, I think the archive is often in the organisations, or it's either been institutionalised and appropriated and it's in the university, or it's been taken by scholars and other academics and pulled into another research orbit. Mm -hmm. But we kind of need to reclaim it, and I think because that's the archive that younger generations of artists are going to tap into with the vengeance, hopefully, through, through our support. Um, the, the notion of co-opting capitalism in the context of Tom's example, I think, is really key as well. The notion that you know, there is this kind of dominant capitalist system, it doesn't necessarily um, rule us completely, but we can change the, the, the logic and the mechanics of the system by trying to work it against the grain, which I think your example, Tom, is, is, is a wonderful one to do. Um, in, in the context of our voice, I think, there's this, this notion that the art sector has a voice or that it tiptoes around having a voice. So there was, I heard a contradiction in what you guys were saying about allowing artists to articulate and express themselves and to have that voice and not to in any way impinge, if you like, on that voice. And at the same time, for us not to have a neutral voice, for us to claim a political voice. And I suppose I'm hearing it in all of the groups, this need to step into a very clearly articulated political space and not be afraid to, to express this voice um, and to express our, opini our opinions in a way that where we're not self-censoring. Um, and also the notion that Brexit isn't necessarily a problem, not to see it as a problem, not to see it as something that's reactive but to work around it in a proactive way. I'm not quite sure how we're going to do that yet because we're not quite sure what it's going to manifest as. But I do think it's an interesting provocation. Um, the, the other issue, though, I think is the elephant in the room, and it has been referred to, is the notion of funding of artists, the precarity, the constant um, economic landscape in which artists are working, this kind of devaluing of artists as workers, but also artists themselves devaluing the value of their work. And I don't think that has changed much in the last while, and unfortunately it's sort of becoming more, um, sort of, if you like, dramatic as, as, as the economic climate starts to get tighter and tighter. Um, the, 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 the notion of commissioning without a budget, though, I think is really interesting. And I, so I'm not, not Yeah, <laughs> because I think that's the situation that lots of people are in. So I think it would be very, and I, I guess Tom's point is sort of you, your, your project stemmed from that, you know, the, through adversity, through lack of funding, what can we do? Um, and, you, and you do it by not working against the grain of the system, but looking at the system and, and if you like, taking it apart and putting it back together in a new guise in the context of your project. And also the notion of when you're referring to creative social and economic capital, I would add political capital. Because I think this goes to the heart of the issue where we need to strategize as well. And I think we've all articulated in the group. Um, our, our stepping away from being very overt to did the notion of the politics of programming and the politics of geography, which is I think this group here was bringing up. The idea that certain large organizations have absorbed, if you like, our very vernaculars and now are very fluent in them and are telling them back to us. But at the same time, will not budget to train the artists who need to work with and alongside the communities that they are a part of. So there's a real divide there, and that needs to be addressed in some way, both strategically, um, from our own perspectives, I think if we were to collectively write narratives that became strategies that were communicated, that affected some policy change within this area. Um, Obviously, the community-run projects, it's a given that the, the culture is embedded and it's organic within communities, and that's where it needs to come from, rather than artists being parachuted in. I think everybody agrees with that in the room. Um,
yeah, and that the and that the notion of resilience is 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 both individual and it's collective. That if you've been displaced or if you've moved or if you've journeyed, you bring with you with you your tactics of resilience. It's a given. It's a kind of aspect or facet of human nature. Um, and and that the stories of resilience and the memories um, of displacement can be, if you like, um, shared in different ways. The one example you gave of the the, the homeless shelter where people started to identify with each other across difference but yet yet connected because of a shared notion of displacement and that through that shared notion of displacement a sense of belonging was found and then you get the sense of the real transformative power of culture uh, as a means to move people into different spaces. Um, and then the um, incredible stories, as, as Scylla was saying, of, of community activism, civic activism, um, and the memory of that, and the living memory of that, which is living memory, it's the three, four generations, but it's there. And that, you know, maybe we need to um, question our own prejudices, this came up in Scylla's group, uh, where the left, the art sector, perhaps has its own little prejudices and can discriminate as well. Um, in maybe very subtle and nuanced ways, um, but we're not very good at maybe interrogating, you know, what that might be and how we articulate those prejudices, uh, both in terms of the decisions we make about work that we support, but also um, our ability to talk to people who don't necessarily share opinions. However, I'm going to end on this note, it's a real provocation. We've heard since Brexit that in this sector we're not listening to the others who have voted for leave. And I think it's an interesting notion because, you know, we have obviously shared opinions about this and we don't know in this room who voted leave or, or remain, but we have a value system that some of us share in, in, in different ways. But why is it from our perspective, and I'm speaking our in a kind of strategic sense, do we have to move constantly to, into a compromised position? And I think it's kind of weakening our voice. I think we're immediately being asked to, you know, the notion of beyond the babble, beyond the, the echo chamber. And I think we're weak enough as it is, in terms of, you know, medium, small-sized organizations. But we need to really think about how we're going to do that, rather than just make that gesture and compromise and say, yes, we will speak to the other communities, or we will listen, or we're not listening. Because I think we are listening, um, but in different ways. Um, so I'll end with that. So um, the notion of us only speaking within this echo chamber, I would actually contest. I think we don't only speak within an echo chamber. I think it's a hell of a lot more complicated than that. And this room alone sort of illustrates that complication, this community of practice that we've brought together. So I suppose when the last few minutes is to see, are there any key, clear action points that we might want to take further as a network, as a community of practice? Um, to share, to, to take action on, and, or to elaborate on further um, over the next period of time. So, what are the key points? We could have three, we could have four, we could have none. When you talked about measuring impact, yeah. how do we quantify what we do and share that, I suppose? I don't, I don't think we always, certainly I don't always profile what I'm involved in as well, as well as I think I would like to, mm -hmm. or, or as effectively as I could. Mm -hmm. So who is it that we connect up with, which other organisations can help with that profile? How practically could that be done? Mm -hmm. um, well, I suggested after you said that, I said yeah. everyone should connect with their local What Next chapters. Um, if everyone knows what What Next is, it's a national movement that is all about advocating the role of arts and culture in society. Um, and kind of also at the moment we're looking a lot at civic responsibility of arts and cultural organisations and the Manchester group is really active, often meet at home um, and that might just be a really quick win action for everyone to connect with what next perhaps and we'll start your chapters um, as well. It's quite a senior management level thing isn't it? Well, we meet here on yeah. a Monday on, on an early morning so it's kind of, it's quite, it's not open to everybody is it? It's it it is, yeah. Um, yeah. And there's what next generation groups? So I chair generation group in Leicester, which is for people that feel more comfortable, not kind of with artists directed with CEOs and stuff like that. Um, but I definitely recommend getting in touch with Dave Mutri or Roddy from Portland Antigua, who kind of co-chair it, because it is really open to everyone. And then if they get too big, then you often find that chapters will form around 
certain themes or geography or different things that might come mm. out of it if the groups do get too big they don't function properly. Uh, but it's definitely open to all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, um, I think it was point two on what you said, and it's, you know, it's about the nature of reclaiming the art. I think you said reclaiming the archive, but you know, there is a history, isn't there, of, you know, of community arts, but it's a specific, it is a specific history, and I think there's a history yet to be written in terms of the terms that we're, you know, the focus of today, and particularly in the sort of Brexit landscape as well. There is quite a lot of academic writing around Joe Moriarty and Alison mm. Jenkins are just about to produce a publication. Freeform Arts Trust in London has produced history at the moment. So there is quite a lot of publishing. I mean, the archive, I mean, in a way, it relates to all, you know, arts happening in the communities right across the country. I mean, yes, it's a kind of a millstone around my back at the moment because we know we've got this massive archive. 40 years, and it's not just our archive. We've, we know deep down that's the people's archive because it's a history of people mm -hmm. in Manchester. Um, so it's a huge responsibility, and in, in a way, I have to be honest, with the pressures on our organisation, sure. we're just sticking our heads in the sand because mm -hmm. we haven't got the time. But we know it's really important we should do something about it. Mm -hmm. yeah, the head of Heritage Lottery, but it's on there, sure. it's on the list of really important things. Mm -hmm. We need help. Mm -hmm. Um, to do that really, um, but I'm aware if we're not seeking help, we won't get help. Mm -hmm. and part of the reason why we're not seeking help is because we're doing so much else. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's tough times yeah. you know, for the arts and people that are working in communities. You've got to just quantify, like, you can't, yeah, we'll talk to you about that if you like. You want to. <laughs> you know, it's, it, it, you know, we're working to so, under so much pressure. I'm, I don't want to. Know, sound negative, mm -hmm. um, but that at the moment, if anybody else is working in the arts, I don't know if you share that. But the pressure that is on organisations sure. delivering the work, um, you know, it's, okay. it, it's, it's tough. So I have to admit, you know, we've been really bad, and I've got my head in the sand. Mm -hmm. But I know mean, it's really important. Yeah. I do agree with you. And, so and it's any not, suggestions yeah. you would have, or maybe I could chat to you about that. Sure, and, and it's not necessarily, you know, just in terms of because I was really struck by your point about you know, sort of, um, I guess the sort of co-op, you know, academic sort of taking, you know, rather than that kind of, his, you know, it's the history from below and it's that, do you know what I mean, the sort of, um, that, the grassroots level nature of the art and being able to sort of, you know, produce, produce it or share it with the, you know, there was a lot of talk about sort of respect and, you know, um, recognition of where that's come from. Um, and so it's in that sense really, and it, maybe that is something to sort of take forward as a potential, you know, how do we map a route through this? Because, you know, both, both the university sector, not to the same degree obviously, but you know, we're all, you know the audit culture is um, almost sort of paralyzing. And I, was, I, I think your point about self-censorship was really important point as well. Um, because I think that happens across the board, really, in the current terrain, and you know, in the context of um, the audit culture and measuring everything. Um, so, you know, from a university point of view, you know, why aren't we out there, you know, sort of challenging? You know, why are VCs challenging? Well, you know, it's because of lots of reasons, but funding and the relationship to government and stuff like that. Um, but there might be, I mean, I'm sure there is a way forward. Yeah, I'm just thinking very practically speaking. Um, if you de individualize the, the challenge, say, from one organization perspective, and you did a mapping exercise, if there was a way of getting a small bit of funding to begin with a mapping exercise to look at the, the various archives, if you like, that are there and that are still living, but, um, and then identify the, the landscape and then go for a heritage lottery grant. But like maybe it's either through platform a network or whatever network would would emerge, um, and then the part of the grant would be very much about it would be a very equal application, right? So between the organisation and the researchers and whatever the end product would be, and then the end product is accessible to the wider wider set of practitioners. Um, so that's one way of thinking about it. Can I ask a question about that? Because <coughs> we get a lot of things done by students. Is that not? 
possible in this case? That some students just take it without any funding application just as their own project or a series of projects? Mm -hmm. I just think you also want to have sort of practical and I was quite taken by this thought of archives as well and how important they are. I think from our own or people who run events like this, which you mm -hmm. it does, if you, one of the projects you talk about is something from the archive, you start making that. We do do a thing when we tweet, a uh, sort of throwback Thursday, just a project from the recent past. Mm -hmm. But that can be quite powerful. And I, uh, we talk about this all the time as well, about how do you, I think we sense that it's very important. But maybe, yeah, just starting to put it on the program doesn't have to be, and we're going to interrogate all the yeah, yeah. lessons and how it reflects. It could be just, we're just going to share that. And maybe if you can bring some, a couple of people who were involved in that thing 10 years ago. Yeah. We, um, do, we do that on our, we do have an archive on our website. Right, which yeah. is just, this is a good project. Yeah, archive. yeah. But I have to say, we're probably not, you know, keeping that up to date. No, sure. Um, but it, there's small yeah. steps, yes, yeah, only for events and stuff. I think, obviously, this film, this net, the Stuart yeah. Warbridge, is a brilliant example of that, mm. of the archive being brought to life. Mm. So that has, so there is that context. About it, I know there's another job to do. But if we were to think about it on a more of a collective level, and maybe there were, you know, other organisations and there was a kind of working group of people who were mm. thinking more widely, then it would feel less like all of that is on our shoulders, do you know what I mean? Yeah, and more like a collective Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it might help. There's an architect with boxes and boxes and boxes, mm. isn't it? Covered in dust, and there are all the filters in the back. Yeah. And it just feels like such a responsibility mm -hmm. that it scares us all. Mm -hmm. And then it makes us archivist as well. We do contacts, mm -hmm. archive. yeah. archives. Archives Plus have a lot of stuff about community that um, has no contacts, archives gone. Mm -hmm. And um, there's like virtual exhibitions in the ground floor of Central Library under Radical. So if you want to have a look at his stuff. Uh, so we could learn from that and then you know with the support of the university that might kind of help. I think we need support with the other people to come in and help us with it. We can't do it on our own. Yeah. I, yeah. Um, your issue about websites I think is is one repository where people can get access to it. So I think it's very important. But just picking up on the you said you got films and the covers and things like that. Northwest Film Archive is completely, well not completely, but predominantly dedicated to practice in the northwest of, of England in terms of what it records and uh, it's, it's a tremendous archive and, but there's a problem, like I, I worked, as people see it, at uh, Workers Film Association or people might know as WFA and it recently closed down the building probably at this moment is being uh, demolished but there was there was a lot of material, a lot of events that were documented or recorded as they were happening over the period of the late 70s and the early 80s. And that process, however frustrating it was that films weren't being made of things that were recorded, history was being recorded. And I think it's important that all of us, it's incumbent to record as we go along what we're doing. But in respect to the Northwest Archive, the Film Archive, they will take those films and things, they have two, 256 uh, titles of WFA material have recently gone to North West Film Archive. So they will just take it off and have So if you engage with them and say, look, I've got this and this took place in Northwest and it's on this format, yeah. they they really want that sort of practice that's, that's taking place that's in Northwest. That's really useful to know, because so yeah. you know, we've got lots of old, we'll talk about it later.
estate working with social housing provider um, means that there is, you know, there is sustainability beyond the project. So we can parachute artists in because the, it does, the sustainability doesn't rely on that particular artist because there's other professionals who are still there beyond the life of that one project. Um, so it might be that I just want to commission in a group to come and you know work with a group to write a play about cohesion, for example. You know, I do. I'm looking for that now. And, and there might be people in the room who can do that, and I don't know. So one central place, if that's even possible, mm -hmm. or just to you know, how do I know to look on your website to find your case studies if mm -hmm. I don't know you exist? So it's mm -hmm. that one point of contact really for artists, for commissioners, for local, because Bolton at Home as a housing provider are really lucky that we have an in-house art service. But there are lots of other social housing providers who are lucky who have budgets. Mm -hmm and have cohesion, community cohesion as an agenda, but don't know, literally don't know where to start. I might not think of art as a solution, whereas it can, you know, it can be, but if that's not on your radar, you're not looking for an art project, why would you even struggle across it? So something that, um, you know, can be shared across non-art, the non-art sector as well, there's just, they look at what we can, what we can do, because, there's, there's budgets here and there's artists here and sometimes we don't always bridge the two. Um, can I also mention something that um, I just want to kind of, uh, because I felt like it hasn't been, you know, from last year to now. We talk about the, um, you know, we need to engage communities and how we can happen. And sometimes when I look at it, sometimes looking at the question and is this so important takes more time than the action. Because when you look at the needs of actually doing something like identifying the actual artist and do something about it, it's not happening. But you look at there is so many times that being put on, okay, there is a need, but is the need is important? Because you look at the people in the power that they are not in the communities and they ask the community or senior just organization to do this. And then they can see the need, but there is so many times that kind of spent on how, like, is it important, is it that important? And then you realize, like, for a few years, that's been events and going towards these questions, rather than also having an actual case studies of actions that have been happened and bringing those artists from the actual communities to bring it together. So I just want to kind of, uh, you know, just myself as a part of, can I just really appreciate, like, the amount of also like time that the team just put on talking to the artists and kind of make it happen. But there is also like, is another barrier that we talk about that there is less money, less accessibility. So basically making that link to kind of hire, okay, so there is need. There's always been talking about this need. So just some actions needed to do and there is some money needed. So these actions need to be done. Then we're gonna have some case studies to actually kind of put it on the ground and say that, you know what, we talked about this like previous years. This is what has been done. And so I'm kind of wanted to say that, you know, especially that it's always been in the back of my mind that when you go through like all the different stages, at the same time as an artist, at the same time as somebody who wants to kind of understand the system, like, you know, just and talk about to, you know, just talk to other artists from different communities. So I think it would be amazing to kind of also looking at, you know what, there is an action plan that we're going to do and we're going to bring it on the ground and without spending so many time on looking at, okay, is it, are we going to tell to the hires that, you know, just this is important, this is important. So, yeah, just I, I hope that it could kind of say, you know, just it's kind of, you know, just there is so many um, time has been spent on finding those needs and we talk about all these barriers you kind of figure out okay there is this need there is this barrier so i would love to kind of always you know just see that we're going to bring up so many more case studies because we talk about for example lisalpo like one of the projects in can or other <coughs> projects that kind of being even the outcome was even higher than you know just what you kind of expect from bringing communities together which is beautiful but when you look when you look at it later it's just kind of it was more than okay, there is so many barriers regarding applications and, to, uh, and uh, kind of uh, goals and targets that you need to achieve that kind of affects on what you want to achieve. It, I think it needs to be addressed more and actually make an action plan, basically. Okay. 
think we will have an action plan. I think will we keep it quite simple because we're yes. running out of time. Can I just yes. go back over those two points? Because yes. maybe it is quite simple. Maybe it doesn't have to be complicated. I mean, I think you're absolutely right about an action plan. Is it about impact, shared methodology, understanding you know metrics and outcomes, sharing those impact plans and and ways of of applying evaluations and archives? They kind of two are collect you know connected. The notion of a repository where you have the living archive, which is the actual archive, and the recent case studies as well. But you also need to know the impact of that work, right? Because otherwise you need to evidence it to both you know, prospective funders, but also other, other parts of the audience for this work. Um, and given that it's the Northwest, we can kind of narrow the geography a little. Um, and it might be interesting to kind of transcribe the, the notes today, pinpoint the key key action points and then see if there's a way of pushing that, that, that central point around impact and resources and repository or archive forward. Um, does that make sense? It does, um, I, but I'm hesitating because um, we do know the impact of our work because we have to measure it and report on that pretty regularly. I don't know if anyone agrees with that. That's something a lot of organisations, we're a national portfolio organisation, we have to do that for the Arts Council, we have to do that for Manchester City Council, we have to do that probably for about 15 other funders. So we have that data, we do collect the data. Um, what we find in terms of the measurement, we also use Manchester Metric to measure our work. Um, but what we find that is what tells the story of our work is using the data to tell the narrative of what we do. And that's something that is hard when you're reporting back on the work, it's hard to report back on because you never have the space to do that. That's where the archive comes in. Mm -hmm. um, increasingly, to tell the stories of our work, I'm not sure that. Does it, is this, is, is this yeah. ringing anybody's bells? Anybody can it's also, I mean, with it? it's it, not as easy. Oh, God, it's boring as well. But it's the whole thing of kind of, it's the whole you know, thing of impact measurement and metrics and stuff. Yeah, it's it, it, the level of Amy Saw, yeah. Simon Miller, yes. the Super Chief Executive yes. of the Arts yes. Council did a blog post about this. Yes. Um, and I sort of and it was all about, you know, how do we develop a oh. new system to kind of measure the impact of the arts? And you just think he's talking from a business point of view essentially. It's a business model. And it's, a it, and it's government it's agenda because the arts council is, you know, directed mm -hmm. by the current government. So it's, I think, there's a real issue with measuring and impact. And well, it's just that when it came down to how amazing it was and what we were going to do, Manchester Metric was a thing that came up again. And it's interesting, actually, the Manchester Metric, which has been piloted by mainstream arts organisations in Manchester, is not used by lots of all those organisations. Because they say it doesn't work. So, um, I, what I don't want to do is, I mean, I would rather if we're going to have an action plan, um, it has to be something that we're all passionate about, that maybe we're not doing. I don't know, that's not to be, I know it's important to measure what you do and the impact, but I think um, within all that, I'd be more interested in how we create how to be able to measure the values of our work. How many jobs it's created, how many, you know, what the link is to kind of lowering crime rates. So, what leads, um, sorry, what, what you need is different necessarily to what we're reporting on as, as an arts organisation. So, it's also, you know, we're just talking very widely, we're not necessarily having the same conversation here. Really. I think we're in a different landscape now, aren't we? Clearly. Um, so, I have never had targets allowed to work organically, you know, you start off with a group about doing IT and you end up with a play about domestic violence, like it's been that open really. Um, whereas now, when I no longer live in that world, that beautiful feather boa world that I lived in before, I live in a different one now. So it's what, and again, it's this not, it's this not working in a silo and not reinventing the wheel. So even if I don't want to do it, because I think it's incredibly boring, also, which is why I never didn't do it before. But now I have to do it. So it's rather than start again. So just it might be as simple as well look at the Manchester metric and there you go. I didn't know about that before, so now I do. So it's that not starting over again when there's so much 
at, you know, between a network that, where I, you know, yeah. I want to go out yeah. and start again. Um, and I would also really like, if someone wants to organise it, a crash and, crash and learn conference. I think we'll learn much more from what goes horribly wrong than we do from what goes really well. Because I, I've, I've listened to so many presentations uh, of wonderful projects, and I think, do you know, if you just scratch the surface of that a little bit, I don't think actually it was as wonderful as you're making out. But, you know, if you tell me to stand up and case study my best projects, I'll tell you how wonderful it is if that's what you want me to do. But actually, you'll probably find it much more interesting if I tell you about everything that went wrong and how the challenges and, you know, how things went, turned out completely different to how I originally intended. But actually, that was a good thing. But we don't, you know, I, you see people case study things and think, I know for a fact that didn't happen. How you're saying that it happened, but we stuck, we, our society says that we stand up and talk about all the great things. When actually, let's talk about it warts and all. I think that would be much more valuable than ticking a box for the Arts Council. Or I love that idea, actually. <coughs> doing kind of presentation board projects. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 It's that, it's that yeah. sort of car crash TV thing. Everybody, you know, people, you can sell out in that conference. Yeah. That's a really boring idea. Maybe that'd be another sort of strand to the conference. Uh, boring ideas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I've, I've got to go now, but I just want to chuck it in. Um, I want to bring forth a really boring and unattractive issue of low uh, taxation of profit-driven multinationals. Um, and I read on the New uh, Economics Foundation website really, a really interesting blog about how there's a lack of ideas of how to bring this boring, unattractive. Uh, issue into the public realm, which is actually one of the sources of austerity and therefore Brexit. So, if anybody's interested in in that, it's a really boring project. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've got to go now. But are we going to share? Uh, so, contacts? I wanted to ask if everyone in this room is happy for me to share email addresses. So that's something we can do straight away. Uh, is everyone okay with that? Okay, great. And also, we will we will put together a film of this event, so that will be available on YouTube. We'll send that to you. We'll also send Julie's report on intercultural dialogue on to you. Um, please, please fill in an evaluation. I've lost half of the room, and I've not said evaluation. So please, I'll send those out. If you don't get a chance to do it now, there's some on the table. So please fill them in. Uh, and I will send them out subsequently as well. Um, and how, how do we move forward on this, um, just briefly, on these action points? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, maybe we'll narrow them down further following Silas. I mean, I take your point. I, I think you were saying something different about, about impact as well. I mean, if, if we were to narrow it down to... I mean, because one of the problems with action points is that they get too complicated and nothing yeah. gets done. Yeah. But it seems to me that there's a kind of desire for this archive to somehow find some bodily form in some way. Um, and maybe there's a way of, you know, is it, a, is it practical to create a small working group that will report back, um, thinking about, because everything needs funding, to start with some kind of mapping exercise to begin with. It might be a research project at some point mm -hmm. with somewhere. Or well, well, I think Tom's point, you know, connecting back to student, yeah. to student intern to gain experience or, you know, maybe a master's student's dissertation or, you know, where it's kind of a shared um, process. Yeah. You know, and, and very much kind of participatory rather than, again, you know, the university flying in to do stuff and then going out and producing. You know, I think that's not the model at all mm. that I you know, mm. would support. Mm. But is that something that you could maybe progress mm -hmm. in, in connection with the people who've been here today? That, yeah. we, that, that someone goes away and then actually kind of comes with some mm. steps for that rather than we go away and we don't do yeah. anything? Well, there are two, I mean, the two sort of things that I was thinking. Um, one is that we've got a um, you know, fabulous women's studies centre at York that's very much kind of based on the kind of principles that underpin your organisation. So you know, it's very sort of collective, collectivist. Um, and there's a master's, a master's um, part of the master's is a module on arts and activism. So, you know, that kind of might be somebody's master's thesis. Um, but there's also the Centre for Applied Human Rights um, that similarly has a sort of, you know, an arts and activism type uh, master's degree. So. 
Um, and there's loads of fabulous people who take that, you know, that have got just wealth of experience. Many of our, you know, some of them are artists. So um, that's also would be a kind of potential. Um, and I could go back to both centre directors and say, how do you feel about this? Mm. Yeah. Mm. That, that would be good. Because it's just progressing that conversation isn't beyond today. So yeah. yeah. And then we can get back in touch with people. It would be good to get Sharon's experience as well. Yeah, yeah, very much so, yeah. Um, I, I think making archives not boring and not just mm. putting them away in the yes. basement. Mm. And um, we created a living archive, so it's called makingcontactmcr.com. And um, we interviewed 70 people about contact history and created short films and uh, longer films, so there's one of the interviewees. And there's also a live archive on there, so anyone who's had experience with contact, whether you've just gone and seen a show once or whether you've worked there, you can write your stories, attach photos, and it's constantly getting uploaded. And that is a gold mine for funders, because mm. it's like, this is this is our history. I'm writing their Wikipedia page at the moment, and like, so I'm just going through all of the interviews. But yeah, and I'm happy to help with the HLF for you guys. Mm. HLF, I think, is key. Each of the British Library. Oh, okay. It would be very interesting, I think. And is there, and is there anyone else in the room who's feeling really passionate about this and would like to get involved in a small working group, even a long detail that can kind of take it forward? I always was interested in the history of Cannes, which is so amazing to me, so I always would be up for like looking better at the archive. But and it's kind not just about Cannes, it's about no, 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 exactly. all the projects here that want to archive their work, from however small to however big, and individual artists, Sashwati, Satellite State Disco, you've got this stuff in the archive yet. Uh, I won't do. <laughs> 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 you know, so, yeah, this would be something for the region, yeah. where yeah. as Sarah says, we can learn from each other and share information. And is there a way like it that the, your migration network oh, could, sure. could tap yeah. into this as well in the north? Mm -hmm. north, north what's it called? North, um, uh, well, currently it's just University of York Migration Network. Yeah. But um, we're hoping for you know sort of northern reach. Um, and not it's not just university based but you know kind of pra practitioners um, artists you know community members to be part of and make something a bit more lively and um, change causing than you know sort of typical just academic research mm -hmm. okay so yeah no 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 Thanks everybody, we've lost half the room, but yeah, that's okay. <laughs> uh, we have about half an hour before the film, if, for those of you who are going. And it's a very long film, so I just warn you. Very beautiful film, very compelling film. So thanks to everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.